All right, one thing chemists are always looking at is how we can obtain the maximum amount of product from a reaction. And this typically, of course, depends on our reaction conditions. Now, since we're studying equilibrium right now and focusing mainly on gaseous equilibriums, we can look at how can we maximize product formation of a gaseous reaction that has reached equilibrium. How can we get it to form more products? And hopefully you remember Le Chatelier's principle, but that basically says that if you have an equilibrium and it's disturbed, it's going to shift to counteract the change in conditions. It's going to shift in an effort to fix the disturbance. So the first thing we're going to look at is if we change concentrations of our equilibrium by adding or removing products or reactants, what's going to happen? We're going to take a look at our good friend the methanation reaction again that we've seen throughout this unit. And these were, you know, back when we started talking, it's a 10 liter vessel at 1200 Kelvin. These were our initial conditions. And then we found our equilibrium conditions when we solved using the value of Kc. And we talked about the fact that if I cool the reaction vessel, then the water will liquefy and we can remove it. So what's that? what that's doing is disturbing the equilibrium. And so the equilibrium is going to react to restore the original equilibrium concentrations. So since the water is gone, the reaction is going to shift to the right to try and reproduce the water that's missing. Now again, we won't get the actual concentrations back, but you can see the effect. The carbon monoxide and the hydrogen gas, the amounts have gone down because they're continuing to react. More methane has been produced and we see the emergence of more water. So this is an excellent way to get uh, an optimal amount of methane to be produced, keep removing the water. Or you can remove the methane as it's being formed. It's a little easier to get the water to liquefy, of course, because of our intermolecular forces of attraction. And so that's why that is preferred. But the same thing happens too if we add more reactants. So obviously if I add more carbon monoxide or hydrogen, if I put more reactants in, I'm going to get more product out. So that's how we can affect this equilibrium by either removing products or adding reactants. So that just kind of makes sense, but how does it you know, tie into what we've been looking at with this Q and KC stuff? Well, at equilibrium, our Q expression, our Q numerical value is equal to the equilibrium constant. So here we see our Q expression for my methanation reaction. Now if I were to remove water or the methane, then those concentrations would go down and my Q would go down. And we know that when Q is smaller than Kc, the reaction is going to shift to the right towards the products. Same thing, if I add hydrogen or carbon monoxide, then mathematically when that denominator gets bigger, the Q is also going to get smaller. And so again, we see why the reaction is going to shift to the right towards the products. Now, for some reason, if I would add water or add methane, if I would add products to my reaction, or if I would remove my reactants, that's when mathematically we would see that Q is getting bigger than the equilibrium constant, and the reaction would go the other way to the left to form more reactants. So typically not something we choose to do. And the only small side note here is that if our equilibrium constant is so small, like 10 to the negative 100 for example, then the equilibrium is basically all reactants. So adding more reactants to the pot will really not have an effect. And that just kind of makes sense. All right, next we can change pressure conditions. Again, since we're really talking about gaseous equilibriums, if the equilibrium involves a change in total moles of gas, meaning the amount of moles of gas on the product side and the reactant side are different, and if we increase pressure by reducing the volume of the reaction mixture, then the reaction is going to shift to where there's fewer moles of gas. So if we increase the pressure, the reaction is going to shift to where there's fewer moles of gas. If we decrease the pressure, the shift is going to be towards more moles of gas. And that's because, of course, where there's more moles of gas, 
there would be more pressure, more particles, more collisions, more pressure. So if we decrease the pressure, the reaction is going to try and get it back. If we increase the pressure, the reaction is going to try and get rid of it. So again, here we have our methanation reaction. And on my left hand side, there are four moles of gas. On the right hand side, there are two moles of gas. And so if we were to cut the reaction volume in half, then the pressure is going to double. AKA also the concentration is doubling. So which way will the reaction shift? For this reaction, it's going to go towards the products. It's going to go in the forward direction where there's less moles of gas, less pressure is existing there. So the reaction is going to try and get rid of it that way since we doubled it. As it says there, of course, we're trying to restore our equilibrium pressure. It won't get exactly back there, but it's going to do its best to, to do that. Again, just a reminder, we're just talking about pressure changes, so we're only looking at gases. So just like we did with our equilibrium constants, here we have a reaction with solid carbon in it. But you can see there's one mole of gas on the left, two moles of gas on the right. So again, an increased pressure, we're going to for force the reaction to go backwards to the left. A decrease in pressure will force it to the right. The next thing we can do to change our reaction conditions is temperature. Of course, we know that increased temperature typically increases our reaction rate, so the reaction gets to equilibrium quicker. Now, with our gaseous reactions, many of them are very sluggish at room temperature, but very commercially, commercially feasible at higher temperatures. And so that's why we study this temperature change. But when we are looking at temperature effects, we're looking at delta H. So if we have an exothermic reaction, in my mind, in the reaction, that means heat is a product. So if we increase temperature, that basically means you're adding a product. So the reaction would go back to the left. If we decrease the temperature, that means we're taking the product away. That's going to force the reaction to the right. Endothermic, heat is reactant. It's going in. So again, if I increase temperature, am I adding the reactant? It's going to force it to the right. Decrease the temperature, bring it back to the left. So again, our methanation reaction has a delta H of negative 206.2 kilojoules, so it is exothermic. And if we also remember, our equilibrium constant varies with temperature. It was 3.92 as we were studying this reaction before at 1200 Kelvin. Way down at 298 Kelvin, it's 4.9 times 10 to the 27th. And it slowly goes up from there until you get to 1200. So what we see is an exothermic reaction is going to have a larger equilibrium constant at lower temperatures, smaller at higher temperatures, and vice versa for our endothermic. Endothermic reactions have large equilibrium constant at high temperatures, smaller at lower temperatures. And what that essentially is saying is that for endothermic reaction, the amount of products are increased at equilibrium by increasing the temperature. Exothermic, the amount of products are increased by a decrease in temperature. And again, that's the whole heat is a product, heat is a reactant, adding and removing it. I think that's the best way to think about that. So basically what we can get down to is describing our optimum reaction conditions. And here's our famous Haber process for the production of ammonia. And we see that it has a delta H of negative 91.8 kilojoules. It's exothermic, so we want lower temperatures. Now again, a lot of gaseous reactions, we don't want to go all the way down to room temperature because they're pretty slow. And so experimentally, we found the temperature to be 450 degrees Celsius. I know that doesn't sound very low, but for gaseous reactions, it is. Now there's four moles of gas reactants, two moles of gas products. Less moles of gas are produced, so we do want to run this reaction at a higher pressure. Again, experimentally found to be 600 atmospheres. And again, we also want to continue to add our reactants. And as the ammonia is 
produced, we want to get rid of it and keep forcing the reaction to go to the right. And so again, we cool our reactor, the ammonia liquefies, and it can be removed. The nitrogen and hydrogen are left behind to continue to react. Again, why does the ammonia liquefy before nitrogen and hydrogen? Intermolecular forces. All right, larger molar mass, and so we're going to see the ammonia liquefying sooner than the nitrogen and hydrogen. And again, as we saw in the reaction, there is an iron catalyst, so that is also involved in our optimum reaction conditions. And that takes us to our last part. Is there an effect of a catalyst? So here we see sulfur dioxide oxidizing to become sulfur trioxide. And so based on our Kc value, 1.7 times 10 to the 26th, we expect that at equilibrium, we should mostly have sulfur trioxide. However, it's found that when sulfur burns in oxygen, it makes mostly sulfur dioxide. The oxidation is just too slow. So a catalyst can speed it up. So a platinum catalyst speeds it up. Now, what this catalyst is doing, it is not affecting the equilibrium composition, but it is affecting how fast it gets there. So again, a catalyst has no effect on the composition of the equilibrium. It just speeds up getting there. And so as it says their catalysts are useful for reactions with large KCs that are normally slow. If we have a reaction with a very small KC where the equilibrium mixture is predominantly reactants, then a catalyst really doesn't help those types of reactions. What it, they can affect is what product will form if we have different possibilities. Here is the Oswald process for making nitric acid. Nitrogen monoxide reacting with oxygen and water and we get nitric acid. Where we get the nitrogen monoxide from is the oxidation of ammonia. And when we ammonia oxidizes, there's two possible reactions. We can form nitrogen monoxide and water or we can form nitrogen gas and water. And what can dictate that path is the catalyst. It's been found that when a platinum catalyst is used, we get the desired nitrogen monoxide. If copper catalysts are used, then that's when the nitrogen gas is produced. So again, the catalyst speeds up our reaction. It doesn't affect the equilibrium composition. It just affects how fast the reaction gets there. However, if there are more than one reaction possible, the catalyst can dictate which reaction will be chosen. And so that has obviously huge industrial implications. And so if you're trying to produce a certain chemical, that's how choosing, selecting the proper catalyst can have a big effect. All right, see you soon, hopefully.